Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 369, I chat with personal cinema architect John Bishop about replicating the cinema experience at home. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded August 31st, 2017, episode 369 Bringing Cinema Home. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of AVSForum.com. This week, we have John Bishop returning. He's the founder and president of Bishop Architectural Entertainment Services. Hey, John, welcome back. Hey, Scott. Good to be here. Thanks for coming back for part two of our discussion. We got uh, we got so deep into aspect ratios last week that we didn't cover all, so much <laughs> other stuff that you, that you wanted to talk about and I wanted to talk about with you. So I uh, really appreciate you coming back for part two. The frame is one of the most important parts of the picture, so we spent a little time on it. Indeed, indeed. Those who are uh, watching live at live.twit.tv can join the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv, and you can then post questions as we go, and I'll pass along as many as I can. So today we wanted to talk about applying commercial cinema standards to home theaters or home cinema as as you call it um to to try and replicate the the commercial cinema experience at home as much as possible because that's really the goal of home theater right yes indeed i look at it as an art form and and maybe one of the most important because if you if you look at fine art and you look at literature and you look at the art of music, you know, the fundamental things that uh, sort of move our souls, make mm -hmm. us, um, you know, feel great or terrible or whatever <laughs> the intent of the art might be. That's mm -hmm. all in movies. I mean, movies have a story, they're narrative. Movies have visual images that are frame by frame sometimes art. If you look at, a, you know, La Lars von Trier's Breaking uh, of the Waves his scene transitions are pieces of art. Um, and there are a lot of movies where you just look at one frame and, and usually the director will stop on that frame a moment, especially if it's a transition frame. And it's a piece of art. You could put that in a frame and enjoy it as simply a piece of uh, fine visual art. So movies can be trivial. You know, George Millier's, um, you know, Man in the Moon, uh, mm -hmm. that, that – that that was uh, and and a new entertainment form, but the entertainment component really became the art, became the literature, became the commentary on society, all kinds of things. Movies have changed the world at different times, so they're mm. imp an important art form. And I say that because how important is music? We we look at high end audio and the most expensive speakers we can afford and the electronics, you know, to complement them and the highest resolution music, so we can sit in a space and transport ourselves to a concert, to a live experience in our homes. And that's a really important thing and an exciting thing. Well, movies are that and more because there's the visual component and the stories being told. So I think it's, it's um, the target is what is the art? And I believe the art is what the director designed it to look like and sound like in a professional um, exhibition, the best a commercial theater, cinema, a commercial cinema, um, a private screening room uh, done to the commercial cinema standards, a DCI screening room. There are things and characteristics that go into designing those, executing, and then experiencing them that are distinctive from what we're used to in home theater. And mm -hmm. when you focus on those distinctions, you'll design differently. And that's kind of where this comes from. And I, I call it architectural cinema. Again, I, I talked about elevating it to sort of a, a, a kind of a higher level in terms of performance. And, and you invited me on in November. I consider mm -hmm. that part one. And last week was part two. 
and and now we're part three of architecture. <laughs> cinema. That's, okay. That's really we laid a lot of foundation in the first two shows, and we'll try to kind of s- simplify it so that anybody, whether they were geeks or just people who enjoy movies and the arts, uh, will be able to understand what we're talking about. What's different mm-hmm. about it? Good deal. Um, now, if I may, I suggested uh, I might try something here that I don't think this may be a home theater geeks first. I've got a kaleidoscape here, which allows me to cue things up, and I've created a scene, and this is very apropos to our discussion last week, where we looked at Dunkirk, and what the different exhibition qualities were between, you know, 15 perf 70 millimeter, conventional 70 millimeter, DCI, and 6P 4K laser. So, Mm -hmm. um, you'll maybe enjoy this little um, clip, because uh, this is the movie Mrs. Miniver which was um, 1942. And this is a scene that I uh, labeled um, Return of the Armada. So this is the end of Dunkirk. And this is a gentleman who took his private boat, answered the call, uh, uh, Churchill's call, the country's call, and he's now returning to Dunkirk. And there's two reasons for showing you you this clip. One is the connection to Dunkirk. It's a classic movie. In fact, this movie um, caused Casablanca, the folklore at least says, to delay their their screening that qualified for them them for the Oscars because they thought Mrs. Miniver was going to kick their tush. <laughs> and Mrs. Wow. Miniver did take the Oscar in their year. So there's a boat and a guy that looks pretty beat up. And yeah. um, this clip, anybody can go get this movie and and uh, take a look at it. Uh, you'll notice two things. One, I have it framed on my 255 to 1 screen in 133 to 1, which is the aspect ratio of this movie. And I have it masked. So you see that black edge to the movie. It makes it look better. To the left is my, my 235 to 1 uh, TV. And of course, it doesn't have masking, and you can see. Of course, it's a, a it's an LCD, so there's an elevated black on the bars. But right. the quali- the quality of the image just can't compete. It didn't, wouldn't matter if everything else was the same. If I pull that masking back, it diminishes the quality of the image just a little bit. You're talking about and the masking on the projection screen now, the one in the center of this image. On the projection screen, um, yes. And in fact, uh, let me just do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk up to the screen. I've got the cord. Uh, this this is going to be another home theater geeks first, I think. I but, think uh, see. I just, think so. Yeah. Let me just move it out of the way and see if you can see the difference on the uh, screen. Okay. So you're up there near the screen now, and you're about to okay. pull away the masking. Oh, and yep, look at just, that! Just look on one that. side. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can see the difference not between even, one side not and the even other. Close to the quality of the other side. Yeah. Um, this is a manual masking system. I maxed out the width of my screen for my room. There wasn't room for a, a motorized masking system. So, you know, my wife, Cindy, is uh, very handy. She built me a manual masking system with a hard edge that I can move to each aspect ratio. Hmm. Now, you can't hear you this must sound. Have those as, which is fine. Except, listen to this clip, Scott, and you'll know where Hans Zimmer um, um, and Christopher Nolan got that low droning sound that goes oh, continuously. in Dunkirk. The movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guarantee yeah. you they watched this movie and took notes because that sound is what they basically um, transformed as the baseline sound throughout the entire movie, Dunkirk. Mm. Okay? so Let's give it a little listen here. Oh, oh, you, you, that, okay, that, I got that, you. That part, that part was over. That part was over. All right, all right. By the way, uh, just for just for people's information, uh, Kaleidoscape is a movie server, very high end, very expensive uh, movie server that lets you uh, that basically plays uh, Blu-rays and now Ultra HD Blu-rays at their full resolution, having stored them on the server. Uh, They went through some legal troubles a couple of years ago, but they've they've now managed to figure out a way to do that legally. Uh, and you can pick, as as John just did, you can pick any clip you want and mark it and play it and have it queued up. And uh, that's pretty cool. So uh, thanks for showing us that. 
And in fact, um, if you can see on the TV, the beautiful thing about it is all of your movies are there. And yeah. what I do, besides seeing the pictures of the movies, is for training purposes, I've got all of my movies organized in, a, in collections. And every collection, you might even be able to see it on the screen, is organized oh, yeah. by aspect ratio. So there's ah. all my 185 movies. There's all my, my 2.10 to 1 movies. How many movies are there in 2.10 to 1? Not many. Well, I, I can't think of a one. There's, there's one. <laughs> and, what is and, it? And that, that picture is there. It's the big tra trail. That was John Wayne's um, um, first movie, his debut. Wow. What's interesting, uh, uh, Home Theater Geeks should get this Blu-ray because on the Blu-ray, there are two movies. It, it's the only movie that was ever filmed simultaneously by two different directors of photographer in two aspect ratios. 35 millimeter was, was one uh, – uh, three three to one and they shot 65 millimeter negative it was the first widescreen movie besides the abel gantz three camera movie um and and it was uh, uh 65 millimeter at, with an aspect ratio of 2.1 to you know almost uh, the 2.2 .2 at most 70 millimeter movies yeah and if you compare the two You'll see the black levels, you know, the film elements that they went back to to create the Blu-ray. And they took a lot of care. Um, shows what happens when you start with a higher resolution. You start with 70 millimeter film and you look at that on the Blu-ray and the black levels and dynamic range is much better than the 35, which is not bad. None of it's bad considering right. it was a it was a um, on site, you know, a, a non studio production. It was out in the field, the whole thing. Right. So I have to um, mention, I have to mention, uh, just as a side and an aside here, you mentioned this movie, they shot with two different cameras and two different aspect ratios simultaneously. There were other yep. movies, more famous ones, like, for example, I'm pretty sure Oklahoma was one uh, where they actually shot at 35 millimeter and then went back and shot it again in 70 millimeter. I did not know that. Um, yeah. They they often uh, you know like Sleeping Beauty was was um, you know that's a an animation created, um, right. and it was created in two five five to one scope, but in exhibition they transferred that creation to thirty five millimeter and showed it in in two, uh, uh, um, two three five to one in theaters, and in seventy millimeter they showed it in two point two to one in theaters the roadshow mm. version, mm -hmm. and what we have on the Blu ray is a two five five to one they went back to the original negatives and grabbed mm. the two five five not the not the uh in, in, you know the inter uh, um transferred uh, negative to positive from the 70 millimeter but the 65 millimeter negative so we have in sleeping beauty the original aspect ratio that the animators created it in so we see it in a way they never saw it in the day it came out um in the uh early 60s i think it was i think that's a 62 ish movie uh -huh. or roundabout well so, yeah but then again that there you there again we get to the question of what was the director's intent for i mean he sh they shot it or quote unquote shot it since it's animated uh in one aspect ratio but they presented it in a different aspect ratio so what was the director's intent was it the way it was quote unquote shot or the way it was presented in the theater well i would say christopher nolan has and and maybe Quentin Tarantino, we've talked about them both, um, have their preferences. So it's delivered so it can be shown in theaters as they exist. So the best 35 millimeter houses, the 70 millimeter houses, and, and in today's digital world, 6P laser on down. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the directors like it the best in the best venue. And, and the rest of it is sure. how did they frame it? What was their colorimetry? You know, what are we doing at home that is different than, than what they intended? That's where the real uh, um, departure comes when you, mm -hmm. you know, you play something in high dynamic, not dynamic range that wasn't created with that intent. And, and nothing prior to 2015 was created in high with high dynamic range intent. So there's a library mm -hmm. of tens of thousands of movies that we should be able to play as the director intended in our, right. in our theaters. That's what we try to do. So. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's get so let's get that. to let let's get to um, you know the 
bringing the consume the commercial cinema experience home uh and uh you wanted to start that discussion i think with defining what is the cinema experience yes so let us go to um the one that's labeled 100 point Q of experience, the quality of experience. That's a document that might get our, our thinking started. So the, um, the automotive world and the wine world um, have systems to help people understand what the quality of a car or a bottle of wine is. And they both happen to use a 100 point system. Wine Spectator, uh, the Ferrari Club of North America, which takes their, their um, rating system from um, some uh, standards bodies in Europe. Um, create this rating system. So here's my, you know, I've got it zero to 10. So times 10, it's a zero to 100. And along the top and along the bottom, I've kind of got uh, a, a little uh, milestone. So on the far left at the top, it says living room television, you know, an LCD or a plasma relative mm -hmm. to the director's intent for a, um, a theatrical experience that that's in the 30s that's a that's not really a theatrical experience if you go to a larger tv you move forward so so there you go if you want to get into the 60s a standard cineplex is in the 60s um if you go into large format um um there are some low quality large format and 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 uh imax has the biggest screens so if the projector isn't up to snuff that experience gets kind of diminished so it's mm -hmm. a matter of brightness and contrast um i told you last week the 15 per 70 millimeter experience i had at the at the uh, imax i went to happened to be poor because the setup of the film going through the projector was kind of poor mm. um if you go back to the graph we get to the interesting area and that is um down at the bottom uh, large format um, in, in a cineplex. So these would be the 60 foot screens with good horsepower on them. Um, and that tends to be when you get into that size range DLP, because they've got more horsepower per watt than, um, we're, we're uh, talking than the about, we're ta by horsepower, we're talking about light coming off the screen. So how much light can they throw onto the screen and how much correct and, with, correct. and how much lights coming back and, and hitting right. the audience? And you can have higher gain screens. Cinema screens are typically, uh, 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 oh, at the minimum, a little under two, a gain of two, 1.7, something like that, 1.5. Um, only in the finest places and in post-production do you get unity gain or, or, or low gain screens. Um, most of them are silver because of Avatar. They convert it to silver. And those screens are two and a half to three, a gain of two and a half to three. Uh, so you right. see the hot spot. By the, by and, the way, and let, me, let me just make sure everybody understands that uh, silver screens preserve polarization which is how most 3d movies uh, are presented in the commercial cinema with polariz polarized light the left eye is polarized one way the right eye is polarized the opposite way you need a silver screen so that the light hitting the screen comes back to the audience and it's still polarized in the in the way it needs to be in order to when you wear the glasses only the right eye comes into the right eye image comes into the right eye and same with the left um now, gain, just to make sure everybody understands that, is a measure of how much light gets brought back into the audience. And when you have a high gain, unity gain is, is basically the screen reflects in all directions, uh, whereas a higher gain, like two or three, like John was saying, the light is more focused and comes back in a specific direction, but leads to problems like hot spotting. So it, the center of the screen looks brighter than the sides of the screen. So there are all sorts of things to consider when you're talking about screen gain. I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page on that, John. That's all very good. Uh, so I'll say, if you go back to that um, graph, the, 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 the top end is what's interesting. So, so the Samuel Golden is a reference theater mastering labs that do things right in general they have a higher spec in the dci standard review rooms have a higher spec their uh screen uniformity uh center to edge um is is uh 90 has to be within five percent and in theaters they can be uh w within they can be off by 25 percent you can have a oh wow a, a, a corner that's 25 percent dimmer than the uh center by definition and that hmm. that acknowledges the high gain screens that they just have to say, okay, that's acceptable. But, um, uh, you know, a Studio Tech 100, a Snowmat screen, Unity Gain with a projector in the right distance from it, not too close, uh, so that it's a 
you know, a column of light hitting it and not a fan of light can have nearly perfect uniformity. Center, center to corner could be within two or three percent. You know that you, you'd have to measure it because your eye won't see it. That, that's when you really right. get interesting. And uh, you right. know, we saw the uh, the Dunn Academy Theater. That's a reference cinema. Um, I, I, I'd I'd say maybe in some ways a little bit better than the Samuel Goldwyn, just because it's a smaller house. I think it's mm -hmm. a three hundred and fifty seat theater with a screen size that's more appropriate for every seat. Whereas at the Samuel Goldwyn. A thousand seats. They've got row, you know, behind row 18, and it goes out to 24. You're really, um, it's a, just a diminishing screen size. So that experience is is, and that's not where people tend to sit. That's where the camera people set up when they're archiving an event there. So, right, um, right. And then finally, you have the boutique cinemas like Cinepolis in Southern California. So that's the boutique art cinema. Um, I would put the the new Beverly Cinema. Quentin Tarantino is the benefactor of that theater. In Hollywood, mm. that is a uh, you know a repertory theater that does things right, and uh, and and he has made his entire private library available to them. So the screenings there are very interesting. I would say pay attention to that space. Once in a while, they do some very interesting things there, uh, and it's not all Quentin Tarantino stuff, Scott. So you can go; you'll find interesting programs. Oh, good. They, Thank you very much. I'm glad to his, hear that. <laughs> his private library um, has seven of his films. And I'm sure 700 of other films that are, um, right. you know, film, best quality film in the can, you might say. So, yeah, right. so those are the benchmarks. Now, if you go back to, uh, you know, the Ferrari Club and Wine Spectator, the, I, I'm giving you a number for the theatrical experience, the, the quality of the cinema experience. Uh, that's very subjective. But if, mm -hmm. you, if you back into the components like the car rating uh, system does and it says – you know, we're, we're, we're measuring this against perfection. So the showroom perfect car that came off the showroom in 1966, you know, a Ferrari Daytona um, was looked this way. Now let's, let's look at your restoration. And if they find that the owner's manual has a flaw, they take points off. It's very hard to get a 100-point car at uh, Pebble Beach. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you do, it commands a lot of money. But they look at each category. They look at the engine compartment, the interior, the paint, the exterior, underneath every single detail, the labels, the serial numbers, all the badging, every single detail. And they start with a perfect car and subtract points for every flaw. So we do have a reference, and that reference is the best example of cinema, cinema science, um, the way they create it in review rooms, and the way it's shown in the most – uh, um, revered rooms around. So I'd say Cinepolis and some of the private theaters around Hollywood would be the reference. So I'd say that sets the stage for us to look at the individual categories. So why don't we look at um, screens first? So there is a um, pro cinema uh, um, Well, there's one, uh, called, there's one called screen C CSMS parameters. This is the one. Okay. Thank you for helping me with my own thing. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, before before we get to that, Emily the Strange has a quick question. The silver, the word silver in silver screen. Remember, you you, you hear it all the time about, oh, it's the, I'm up on the silver screen. I mean, the, the screens, at least the 3D screens, are in fact silver in color. And the early screens, I think the early cinema screens were also silver in color in order because that's a higher gain. It gets more light back into the audience. Am I right about that? You're absolutely right. It was silver paint, a very specific silver paint. Mm. Yep. I've got an and old screen. Now Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I've got an old screen that dates back to the 20s and, um, you know, a home screen that's in a wooden box and it, it you know, a, pe a couple of wooden arms come out to hold the screen up and you roll it into a square shape. Not, not one, three, three to one, not, it's a square screen with the original mm. silver paint on it. I, I, I uh, think it was a Kodak. I think it was something that they sold with their projectors of the day for eight and 16 millimeter home movies. Right. But the projectors of the day didn't put out nearly as much light as they do now. And so there what needed to be a way to get more light back into the area where the viewers were sitting. And that's why they use silver material. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Just wanted to get Emily's question in there. But uh, let's go ahead back to the um, screen CSMS. There we go. 
Okay, why don't we um, uh, reduce the size just a little bit to get a little bit more on the uh, screen there, Josh, if you would. Now let's scroll down, uh, uh, and we'll end up going by this page. So this is just screen surfaces. You know, it's a cinema grade evaluation. Uh, look, if you look at screens the way uh, cinema engineers look at them, what are the things that they look at? Now, my top bar there, so these green lines are my uh, parameters. The overall cinematic experience level is is kind of where I would place it if all the things below add up. So the first thing is that it has a, a neutral reflectivity. You know, you want the 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 color that that hits it to come back with no change. So that's the first and foremost thing. And what we don't look at as carefully in um, um, uh, home screens as in cinema screens is neutral spec uh, spectral rec reflectivity by angle. So if we go and calibrate a projector by pointing our meter at a spot on the screen, um, you know, at at a perpendic, you know, at a point perpendicular down perpendicular where the, to the uh, screen, yeah. Mm -hmm. the screen um, we can make we can calibrate it and we can make all those little bars um, perfect over the entire color range um, however change the angle of that meter by five degrees or 10 degrees or 20 degrees and depending on the type of screen those bars will start jumping all over the place and if one color jumps differently than another like a red shift which is typical of the uh, what I call conference room screens the ambient light rejecting screens you can't cal calibrate it because the calibration at one point isn't the same as the color returned to you at another point. And I'm talking about five degrees different. Like the person sitting next to you doesn't see the same picture. Now, those are subtle wow. things. But in, but yeah. in cinema, that's that's critical. Um, Stewart developed a screen. They never were in that that game. They had Firehawk, which which had a, a you know sort of a uniform reflectivity, which is the goal number one. But it had um, um, luminance uh, uniformity issues. It's brighter in the middle and darkens to the edges, which is how right. it rejects light. That's the trade off you make. But the colorimetry colorimetry was was a constant. Uh, now they've got one that rejects the light at a much higher angle. Uh, plus or minus 30 degrees with a lot of rejection, but still you can be, the half angle is 120, 60 degrees, uh, uh, which means you can have a 120 degree viewing cone where the furthest person off axis is seeing a dimmer picture. It's half the brightness, but they don't know it. It just looks like it's half as bright, but they see a uniform image and the colorimetry is constant. That's a mm -hmm. critical thing. Not that you would ever use that screen for a movie environment, but at least when you are using it and the sun goes down, it's not um, an absurd compromise. It's a reasonable compromise, and it allows mm -hmm. you to view things in the day. So that's the, uh, that's the trick there. So let's go back to the graphic and, and take a peek here. So flat field uniformity is the next one, and that is the most important thing that we don't really address much in consumer. Um, in, in the commercial world, they not only want the image to be the same brightness across the screen, they want the white to be pure white, no color infusion in that, but they want it to be constant per angle. And because they use gain screens, it can't be constant per angle. So what they do is they, they shade the seating and they say, this is the range of seats that have um, that meet the cinema spec, that the light drop off has not been such that it's out of spec. Um, and it's a basically a, an a, a backwards horseshoe going up into the seating. As you get outside that horseshoe, the, um, the the fact that you're off axis of a screen that's got gain causes the light to drop off, and in some screens, even the colors to, to shift a bit. But that's how cinema looks at it. It's a very critical parameter. Uh, if we go on to the uh, to the next thing, you know the you know speckle and sheen are things. You know when you create gain. You have to do it with chemicals and optics, and that creates a, a speckle, a, a little tiny. We used to use flecks of mica to create, uh, um, a re, you know, to, to compress the light forward instead of having it go omnidirectional into the room, forward to right. the audience. So it's the same amount of light, but it's concentrated where the viewers are, so it looks brighter. But that speckle is an artifact. And the sheen mm -hmm. is, if you look at a screen, a lot of screens you can walk up to with just white light on it, and it looks like uh, almost like you're looking at a stop sign. It's got this sheen and this speckle to it, and to me, that's a hard screen to look at. The best screens look like chalk, a mat, and um, you don't see any characteristic. You just see the image created by the pixels you projected onto it. That's mm -hmm. that's the goal, and that's 
the reference screens in uh, grading and editing rooms, soundstage screens and so forth. Uh, Don Stewart showed you a lot of sound stages when he was on in November, and uh, those screens were all neutral white. You could tell in the snapshots that they were a, a reference screen quality. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go uh, back to that uh, chart, and we'll go down to you know slow slow pan edge sharpness is an issue. Fabric screens and perforated screens will have an issue if you have very thin lines or the corners of a building and the camera pans. That's basically an image moving across the screen. And the fabric, um, you start to see the texture of the fabric. And there's a Twitter, a little, you know, edge uh, noise. Kind of a shimmering. On, a sh well, shimmering or just like an edge artifact um, mm. on every sharp edge because the screen's not flat. The other issue is that a non-flat surface scatters light, individual pixels um, will scatter light. It doesn't matter if they're all white, but imagine a black pixel surrounded by white pixels. We talked about mm. that in terms of adjacent pixel contrast. Uh, a right. screen that isn't perfectly smooth will scatter the light of those white pixels into the black pixel. That's a measure of resolution. That is how um, visually cinema engineers decide that they're meeting the spec that they, that they need. That's how the DCI spec was partly created. Uh, Let's go back to the document and we'll, then we'll move down to examples, right? So resolution, the depth of modulation limits, that's a term that Joe Kane brought to us in uh, his trainings. That has to do with retaining that contrast right down to the pixel level. Um, there are optical uh, uh, engineering terms like the modulation transfer function that people use to literally take a picture of a, 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 a graph with very fine lines know the contrast between those white and black lines and then reproduce it through the cinema process, either on film or digitally and see how many lines can you see and is the contrast between the black and white retained. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it was 100% of the original, it would be a 100 MTF, 100, no such thing. But you try to get as close as you can. Okay, right. let's go down quickly. We'll just look at this is the reference screen that I use, the Studio Tech 100. And by all of these parameters, it's what Hollywood uses and says it is the best. So it has to be the 100. That is the theoretical best. Now, if you go down and you, you add gain to a screen, you keep going to the next page. You'll see it uh, top off again. There you go. Studio Gray 70 is exactly the same characteristic, but it is a fractional gain. It loses 30% of its light to absorption, but it's otherwise a chalk white, a, 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 a chalky screen, just like Snowmat is. It's identical in its characteristics. It's just a tool to to adjust net light output. If a, a projector is overly bright or the screen too small, that was one way we we worked around those issues. Now, if so you it looks like one, it looks is, like it's got a it looks like it's got a rating of 10 throughout as well. It's the same type of material. It simply has fractional gain. Everything else about so, it's the same. Okay. So in other words, it doesn't return as much light to the viewing area as the 100. Right. It's like uh, a set of gray cards for photography. The pure white card and then one f-stop down. This is not a full f-stop. That would be 50. But, uh, but at 70, it's a part of an f-stop. But every other part of the characteristic is the same. Just less light comes okay. back. All right. All right. Now, but the next screen is adding gain. So this is Studio Tech one one thirty, right? So there's gain right off the bat. You see that. By the way, there by the way, just to make sure everybody understands, uh, Studio Tech the way Stuart specs its screens and, and its models, one thirty means a gain of one point three, which isn't very much, but it does return more light into the viewing area than a Studio Tech one hundred, and therefore it will not have as good flat field uniformity, which we're about to see. Right. Yeah. So if you, you, so it's a rational thing to derate it a little bit. Um, there's a gain surface, so the spectral reflectivity is going to be changed slightly, but not much. You're going to get back. But but at off off axis, there's going to be an effect there. And I'd say that Mark Robinson could probably chime in and tell me I'm right or wrong on that one. But the flat field uniformity is unquestionably an issue. Um, so it comes down a little bit. There is a there, speckle and sheen. When you're adding gain, there's something going on there. So those issues. Um, enter into the into the equation. The question is, to end up with 30% gain, did you um, 
engineer the best possible way to get there? Or did you put a gain surface on there that got you there but has higher sheen or higher speckle or higher? That's the trick. If, you, if you're engineering the chemistry of the screen from the ground up, which is unique to Stewart Film Screen, they literally at one end of their campus, uh, trucks with uh, liquid chemicals show up and drop their load. And at the other end, finished screens come out. I don't know that there's <laughs> another screen company in the world that, uh, that is that vertically integrated. Um, right. Okay, let's move on now. And uh, we'll just look at another. Just, just uh, uh, Josh, just scroll down and we'll see different screens. Keep scrolling and you'll see how, just look at the arrows, right? So that right. screen, you know, there's some sheet on that screen. Keep going to page 70 down there and you'll see this is a Firehawk. So Firehawk has some real compromises. In order to make it work, those are the kinds of compromises that happen. To, to reject ambient light means you're doing something on axis. So when the sun down, goes down, there's a compromise there. And if you go down to the next one, uh, this is a more screen. dramatic, uh, this is a conference room screen. So these dramatically reject ambient light and dramatically if, if affect um, the, uh, the visual properties of the screen. So mm -hmm. I'd say we've got enough on this one. Let's go to the one that's labeled uh, projectors. Well, okay, this is microperf. You know, you just stopped there. So what happens with um, microperf? Scroll on and down. And by the way, this microperf, microperf is when you take a flat screen surface, you poke a bunch of tiny holes in it in order to have the speaker behind the screen so that the sound can come through the screen. This is yeah. how all commercial cinemas work. And yeah. this is what Stuart does for home cinema hold as it, well. Hold it right there, Josh, or go up slightly. There you go, right there. Okay, so look at all the arrows that are still pegged. And the reason is where there aren't holes, there's a perfect screen surface, right? So the holes right. lose a little bit of light that go through the holes, lets the sound come through. That's the, that's the point. But other than that, it has perfect flat field uniformity, specular you know, mitigation. There's no speckle. There's no none of those. Now, slow pan edge detail. Yes, the edges of buildings, very sharp, you know, single line, single pixel lines. Um, you will see the effect if you're close enough to see it um, uh, of, of the fact that you're going over the holes. Now, if you go to the next one, I think I've got a fabric screen. Uh, okay, wait, before you, go, before, you, before you go there, a couple quick questions. Uh, one okay. is uh, 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 Drew Nielsen, oh, no, Barfel is asking, what is this? future image that's it, the last the last parameter that you're judging here you know here's the thing before um um i got ready for our uh, podcast today i was talking to a couple of my friends that are members of the uh society of the crossed keys if you're familiar with the grand budapest I, hotel a very I'm secret <laughs> society okay well mm. it's just a funny thing it's a secret society i called a couple of calibrators i needed something to happen in new york and was seeing if i could make it happen and so i'm talking to jim Doolittle and kevin miller and you know jim said Great calibrators. we're talking about theaters we, and we both we all three went to see dunkirk at different places they both saw it at 15 perf imax theaters uh the lincoln center for uh in kevin's case and jim saw it I don't remember. Oh, oh, in uh, um, uh, Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, there's an IMAX 15 perf. They had it set up there. So, you know, and what we said, Jim said it very specifically. It's it's amazing how far we have to travel to find a theater that's as good as what we have at home. So if you do <laughs> things right, if you do things right, right, the, the, you get there. So um, the future comment that I put down there has to do with when content converts to native 4K, is this technology capable of dealing with it without any compromises? So ah. when you're looking at screens, you know, Stuart recently did a measurement of their screens and they've got a little, I think they did a press release, 16K plus, because they measured the limiting resolution of Studio Tech 100 on a 10 foot wide screen. And it was over 16K. So they were able to put the line pair density on that screen and resolve it beyond 16K, which makes sense. 70 millimeter film is how they started in life. You know, they're they're celebrating their 70th, 70th year in yeah. the cinema business. And um, during, you know, when 70 millimeter started to hit, they were the go-to company and they've been dealing with high resolution on the government side as well. So, so. Um, you know, it's easy to do high resolution on a 50 foot wide screen, but try getting that kind of density on a 10 foot wide screen. 
that separates mm. the men from the boys. And that, so, so what I, what I'm referring to there is when we get that higher resolution stuff, are there, is there a compromise a, a fabric screen? In fact, if we go back, the next screen is going to be a fabric screen, I think. And it's got, it's got bigger issues and it will be less prepared for 4k native content because of the light scatter of individual pixels, which is a unavoidable artifact of, of uh, an uneven surface. And, and weave right. is by definition an uneven surface. <laughs> right. So, and we uh, should, yeah. I should, I should point out, make sure everybody understands that we we're talking about acoustically transparent screens here. In the previous case, it was perforated, as Stuart typically does. In the case of screen research and some other companies, they do it with a woven material. It's like a fabric, as you as you mentioned. And the yep. little tiny holes between the threads that are woven into this fabric are enough to let sound through. Uh, so you do get the acoustic, acoustic transparency, which is what you want if you're gonna put your speakers behind the screen as they do in the commercial cinemas, but it gives you other problems, which is what we're talking about here. Right on, so, um, okay, let's uh, wrap up on screens real quick. Uh, we'll go down uh, to that fabric one, and I think you'll see um, how the numbers uh, compare there. Uh, scroll on down. Is there something below that, Josh, or am I fooling you? No, there's nothing below it. Yeah, well, then let's leave okay, that. Okay, that's the last one. Let's leave that one. Uh, you'll just have to trust me on that. So let's go to the projectors one, and we'll uh, spend less time on that. There's not that okay, much. Yeah, that's we called projector CSMS. There you go. Right. Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, reduce that just a little bit, Josh, and then uh, uh, scroll on down, and we'll just we'll look at the things that matter in projectors from a cinema perspective. And again, so the parameters, you know, there's a total experience. Okay, that's a, you know, a little bit of, uh, fl so flat, go back up, flat field uniformity, number one. Okay, a, a white field color purity, that's, those are related. So if you can put a full white raster up on the screen, do you, do you see, now look at a perfect screen. It's Studio Tech 100 now, and it's the projector that will make the difference between corner uh, um, brightness and center brightness because projectors can have a uniformity problem. Their problem is usually more of a modeling, like an LCD flat panel where you see, you know, the, the white is really more cloudy. You see darker and lighter sections all around the screen, all throughout the screen. And if you move from peak brightness to a, a gray a middle gray, a dark gray, and a black, you'll see that that cloudy sky looks different at those different uh, luminance levels. And that's projection technology. Uh, ve very important in cinema. And it's one reason there's only two technologies that have been standardized for digital cinema, which is DLP and SXRD. Uh, so uh, let's With go back SXRD to that. SXRD being a version of LCOS or liquid correct. crystal on silicon. That's correct. Okay, okay, moving back to that. Back to the uh, graphic, to that. and we'll, we'll scroll mm -hmm. on down. So adjacent pixel contrast and the modulation transfer function, uh, pixel uh, pixels per screen height, uncompressed full raster, dynamic range. That means that that's the way cinema looks at um, sequential contrast. You have to hit cinema's light levels, but, and you have to hit cinema's black levels. And 0.03 foot Lamberts is the reference for black. Um and uh, so that's their standard. We're doing better than that now with, with uh, laser projectors. In fact, DLPs have migrated upward since they did that spec. That spec is uh, close to 10 years old now. I think the original DCI document uh, might have been 2007 or 8 in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They did an addendum. Um, so those are the standards. And, uh, and now let's go back. We'll look at a couple of projectors and we'll just uh, uh, resolution limits. Um, so here's just a DCI, you know, this is a DCI reference level DLP projector. It's like the uh, Snowmat. It's the cinema's reference, so it pegs all, it's as good as the technology is today. So there, you go therefore, on down. And, therefore, you, it, by definition, it's all tens. It's all tens. It's all tens. So, and then go on down, and I, I think we're, what are we looking at here? Uh, blue laser, DCI reference, it's same thing, basically with different lamps. There, uh, there really doesn't seem to be much of a of a, a compromise going to the blue laser or or the RGB laser relative to xenon and mercury is a little bit of a comp compromise. Um, let's move on. Let's move out of this one now. I mean, you know, now now you're you're getting a little bit of well, my. Well, before, uh, before we do, this is uh, the the next one is SXRD. You mentioned that is the other technology, uh, yes. 4K projection, which is basically from Sony. 
And here we, we see some compromises. Yeah, and so the DLP uh, manufacturers are going to say, um, hooray for John, and Sony's going to say, what a jackass John is. And, and, <laughs> and, and they would both be right. Um, so this is my, this was my bias. So I look at flat field uniformity and, you know, the SXRDs can make a white field and they can do some, some, uh, um, uh, sort of pre distortion to correct for uniformities, but their issue is that their, their chips are analog. So they can, they can, uh, uh have a little different gain pixel to pixel from pixel one to pixel 2 million or pixel 8 million. If it's 4k in this case, uh, for each chip. Like transistors have a little different gain, so then when they're when they're mated on the screen in the RGB world, and now you try to make white, you might see a little color come through. You'll see a little hint of red in an area or green in an area, and um, they vary. So you can see bad ones and you can see great ones, and I have seen great ones. So it's not like yeah. that, that it's an, an intrinsic problem. It's something to look for, and it is an issue to be cognizant of. Flat field uniformity and white field purity. Um, is, you know, DLP has a little advantage there. Um, mm -hmm. Before we go so on, Barfel has a question. Uh, are projectors ever calibrated to compensate for screen deficiencies or vice versa? I'm particularly thinking of flat field uniformity, but of course other parameters could also, might also be compensated for. They used to be. Uh, CRTs used to have zones where you could change the luminance to um, really it was because there was a red, green and blue gun spread out horizontally. And to make it really uniform on the screen, I get, I'd say it was more the projector that you were trying to fix than the uh, than the screen. But typically, you know, uh, what a calibration is, is um, um, accounting for the screen. Otherwise, you could just deliver the projector calibrated, but the screen mm. is is what's creating the light that your eye sees. It's reflected, um, and and you also have a um, a lamp, and there's uh, you know especially the xenon lamps have a parabolic reflector, and you can cr you can improve the uniformity by adjusting the position of the lamp with that's a mechanical adjustment that the projector goes through on site. Uh, when you're setting up a projector for the first time on a screen, and it 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 has something to do with the throw distance, how far you are from the screen, um, but that does account for uniformity on the screen. Um, you can't undo a, a screen's problem if it's a uniformity issue. I, I don't mm. know of a of a clean way to do that, but uh, uh, somebody mm. could correct me. Okay, let's okay. wrap up. I I think we might be wrapped up there and we can look at uh, how these numbers apply. Uh, go back to that graphic and just see what we got, Josh. I think we kind of covered it. Uh, yeah, we've got, yeah. we got a couple of barcos. Yeah, well, then, then I'm just being a shill. Well, this is 1080. So 1080 versus 4K is an issue. Um, but I would say let's move to – so we, we did screens and uh, projectors. projectors. Let's look at – at projectors. Let's look at um, act actual um, cinema. So let's start with commercial cinemas, and we'll run through there. So um, that's pro cinema evaluations. There you go. Okay, and uh, this will just cruise through because this is me applying that rationale in a fairly. You know, I can't walk in and do the measurements that I do in a residential environment. But uh, moving on, uh, so let's move down. So the the rankings for reference cinemas. So that's just a cover page, you might say. So you yeah, can keep, keep going. Keep going down. There we go. Okay, so keep so going. here's the Academy Theater, oh. and this is a this is actually a screening. Um, uh, Ang Lee did a presentation of the nominated Academy Award uh, for Best Picture movies in a foreign language category. So um, I was able to look at images and judge from the back of the room something about this theater. It's a reference theater. All you have to do is look at the specs for the projection and screen and so forth. So if you move down, how did I rank the system? I gave it a 95. You know, I can, That's I can pretty darn just, good. Just as good as a, a, a reviewer in a magazine. Um uh, go ahead and scroll down because we'll just look at other other theaters. You know how I feel about that one. Sinopolis is that uh, uh, – so there's a couple of screenshots from the one in uh, – I think that's West L.A. Um, and, of course, that's I gave that a 94. Um, you know, it doesn't have quite the scale of of uh, the Samuel Golden. And look at – can I say there's a little bit of arbitrary – there's an arbitrary factor here, but my impression of that – of that space is it's a very very good so it's it's, it's up it's there a subjective at the reference factor. level you're just, 
you're acting like a reviewer uh, of a product. You're just reviewing the entire you theater. Say. You might say, yeah. So, yeah. all right, move, keep scrolling on down. We'll just get a look at a few theaters. Uh, this is out in Palm Springs. This is the uh, Palm de Or Theater. This theater was built by um, like uh, industry people from the uh, movie industry, so that when they're hanging out in Palm Springs, they've got a place that they can go. And I walked in just to check out that theater. It's a white screen, native scope, full masking. And I walked in, whatever movie was playing was what I was going to see. It was tw uh, 12 Years a Slave. What a movie. I mean, not only was the intensity there, but that's just like that Breaking uh, the Waves, the Lars uh, von Trier movie. The, 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 the heart-wrenching scenes were relieved with scene transitions that were the most beautiful photography you will ever see, you know, of fields of flowers and things like that. So um, – uh, that was an amazing movie, but that was a good a good house. I think I gave that a 93. So mm -hmm. uh, move on down. It's just places that I either was convenient. Yeah. So so here's the Cinerama Dome. So that's a reference theater. So the scale in is Hollywood. up there in Hollywood. Gave it a 91. It's a it's a 90 something 95 foot wide screen scope screen. Phenomenal. And um, they they do a wonderful job. So you know I'm splitting hairs, but. If you move on down again, light levels were an issue. I was there and um, uh, 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 John Stig, I think, is the guy who's in charge of all of uh, of the uh, Pacific theaters in Southern California. And that theater specifically is a very uh, well known in the cinema world uh, guy you know, worldwide. Um, he gave me a little tour and he said, you know, this is 3D. But one of our projectors has died. So it's only about three foot Lamberts. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, normally, normally in a normal commercial cinema, you want a peak peak brightness of about 14 foot Lamberts. And so when you go yeah. to a 3D cinema and you're looking through the glasses, you might see three or four foot Lamberts. Uh, but the, well, you're saying you that it was should, only three foot Lamberts see, in 2D. You should see five or six. And that's with a pair of projectors. Um, and when they had one projector down, they saw half that. So it was a fairly dim uh, 3D presentation. No so, kidding. Uh, so I didn't stay and watch it. Uh, right. Okay, let's move on down, and we'll cover those. Then we'll move over to the uh, uh, to the residential. Residential, right? Uh, okay, so this is the um, uh, the the uh, Chinese theater. This is before the IMAX uh, uh, conversion. Oh, no, it's after. This is after. This was the um, AFI uh, Film Festival and the screening of um, August Osage County. Those are the that's the cast and director after the showing but you see it's masked so they masked it properly it's a scope format movie and uh, scott you had the projectionist for the um what is now the tcl theater on yep. your show and yep. he told a story that i was amazed by but but they'll have premieres there it's a major place for hollywood premieres and sometimes the studio will bring a white screen in for the one premiere showing Right? Wow! It's a 90 Is it a silver wide. screen? Is it a silver screen now? Uh, it was a silver screen. I think it's still a silver screen. I think they still, yeah, it's IMAX. It has to be. They use a a polarized a 3D well, system. Well, except for the fact that that's now IMAX laser. And well, as they a could change the laser. Screen. They use. They don't need the silver screen anymore. I I have to I have to check with Thomas. Thomas Larson yeah. is the projectionist, and I actually I need to have, get him back on the show to say, get him back on to, and, and have a post uh, conversion six P laser conversation with him. I'd love yeah, to hear it. Exactly. He, yeah. He, now I don't know that IMAX um, did convert to Dolby Vision uh, spectral. No, 3D, no, no, no. Yeah. They did not. Well, they they converted well, then to spectral three D. No, no. They they they, 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 had, they use six P laser, two projectors with these uh, sort of like Dolby Vision glasses. Adobe 3D glasses, I should say, where the two projectors are showing red, green, and blue, yep. but they're slightly different wavelengths of red, green, and blue from one and from the other. And then that can be reflected off a white screen, doesn't need to be silver, doesn't need to be polarizing, polarization preserving. Uh, and it comes back and one of the filters, one of the glasses filters, filters out one set of red, green, and blue, and the other one filters out the other set of red, green, and blue. Then those glasses uh, are color. The lenses are color. And that would right. tell you. If the lenses look like sunglasses, it's a polarized. If they look like color, right. you know, like a rose color, then it's a color filtering system. Right. Cool. So the new right. IMAX laser projector at the TCL Chinese 
is uh, color spectrum separation is what it's called. Yep. And uh, uh, so they don't need a silver screen anymore. I think they so might have replaced they it with a white out screen. that screen and put a white screen in there. That would yeah. be good. So yeah. get the guy on and we'll find out. All right. Uh, okay, let's move on to... Uh, uh, so uh, highly rated theater, gave, gave that a 90. And uh, this one, this is sort of a collection of the big room. So the XD theater. And out here we have a Cinemark... Uh, um, uh, um, XRD Theater, I think, is what uh, what they call theirs. I think I've got that right. But it's Cinemark, and it's a yeah. reference house. I mean, we travel 100 miles to go see movies at that theater. Uh, we know the projectionist. He's a very good guy, and um, they did it right there. It's a purpose-built new theater. Um, okay, let's move on. That might be the last page. I'm not sure. Let's see what we got. Uh, okay, this is the uh, – that's redundant. Move on. And uh, this is IMAX in general. This is 2K IMAX at, at, in the big rooms. Okay, so this is the uh, one. Well, four, in a three. cineplex, not in as a opposed to the IMAXs at uh, like museums and stuff. Yeah, and I I was disparaging of that uh, when they first did it, and some of them are good, and some of them are really this bad. But uh, but everything's gotten better over time, so I won't mm -hmm. I won't dwell on there. Right there, she's there. Uh, oh yeah, go up a little bit so we can see those graphs. No up. Other way, the other up, another down. <laughs> Stop. No, I meant the little boat, the other little boat. Okay, this <laughs> is uh, <laughs> this is from the patent paper of IMAX uh, digital cineplex conversions. So the the drawing on the left shows a conventional cineplex with slope seating and a screen, and the one on the right says. Make the screen floor to ceiling. Move it closer to the seats. Now nobody can see the bottom of the screen. So make it stadium seating. And that's the that's the patent. That's literally right from the patent paper. And that's mm. what you'll find. You'll walk into theaters where the last row is is one and a half screen heights away from the screen or even less. Their spec is 42 degrees vertical field of view for the last row on the mm. patent paper. So, got okay, it. let's move on up and see what else we got. Uh, showcase it. Okay. Scott, this is why we didn't need that uh, document called uh, Casablanca. I see color in black and white. I've got it right here. Um, okay. The image in the right corner is a uh, a shot of Casablanca in a theater, and that red and that green stuff is what I was talking about. That projector, even though it had been visited uh, not that you know weeks before, um, just didn't have white field uniformity. You won't see that in a color movie. And you, you've got to have a pretty trained eye to see the problem in a color movie. But in a black and white movie, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And that's the issue yeah. you want to watch out for. Yep. Okay, let's move on down. And I think that's um, that's why I that ranked that theater it. so low. It's a beautiful theater, but it was uh, um, they're, they're, they just had oh, problems. Or white field uniformity, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so is that uh, the last In the time we... In the in the time we have left, let's uh, make sure we talk about resi residential, and that's in that. Let's go right to it. Okay, it's uh, CSMS residential. The word residential will be in the title, or or resi actually R E S I, resi. Okay, good enough. That will bring us <laughs> to the. We're rounding third. We'll slide into home. Here we so, go. This, so this is you know I call this a cinema standard metric system. Uh, actually, Runco introduced CSMS years ago. We had press releases on it so that we were looking at specs on projectors after they were calibrated to the standard, you know, Rec 709, 602, whatever, um, because otherwise the, the, the specs meant nothing, and Luminance was the one that was so um, distorted. So if mm -hmm. we look at what matters, the parameters, it's it's similar stuff. But the viewing geometry and the cinematic scale is number one. As I said last week and probably back in November, Scott, it's the first principle. You've got to get mm -hmm. the viewing geometry right. That's based on screen height. After that, if you've got a constant height design, you'll have no problem. If it's a constant width design, well, all of a sudden scope content doesn't meet your criteria for viewing geometry because it you threw 30% of the, of the, uh, of the uh, viewing geometry away. So right. aspect ratio management and format masking is number two. Get the size right and mask it 
and now you've got a chance for a relatively perfect presentation. The first mm -hmm. compromise people make, understandably, is the masking because it can be expensive. I can yeah. I can sell a a, a fifteen a foot wide screen for a few grand or you know whatever five grand whatever the number is. And if you want side masking Vista Scope, you get to spend eighteen or twenty instead. And that's just yeah. the mechanism and control system and all that jazz. Um, it's the beautiful and right thing to do. I can't afford it. Hence my manual curtains behind me. And which you know, your wife that, made for you, custom made. She she did a fine job. She's Indeed. been she's been sewing for me for forty five years this year, our anniversary. All right. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Let's okay, keep, let's let's keep going through this to, last uh, bit document here. Okay. So uh, canvas purity, you know, the, the, the viewing space, go up a little bit, uh, other way a little bit, Scott. So I, I mean, uh, Josh, viewing space and hardware level. Rava is uh, this new concept by Theo. And basically he's curating cinemas, which means we're home cinemas. We're, home cinemas. we're addressing those specs, right? So, mm -hmm. so those standards are the ones, and I'm on the advisory board to help, you know, hold their feet to that fire that they're meeting the the standards according to what Cinema wants, and then we pick hardware, screens, surround processors, you know, Trinoff and Acuras and so forth uh, that do uh, uh, immersive audio, um, amplifiers, loudspeakers that meet the standard, and if we're able to get to the audio uh, page, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, let's let's move on down, and we can see actual uh, theaters now. Um, and, and see how the numbers come out. So if we go to one I think is uh, maybe one I've shown before, it's a good example. Move on down uh, further. It's the 100-point system, and this one is, yeah, so this is the Phoenix system. I gave it a 96. The viewing geometry, the screen material, the projection technology, the execution. Um, I take the audio into account, so this is a, um, a now an immersive audio system. That's the approach, and... Um, there's my, I've got to show you my wine. Okay. <laughs> so so I I present them with a um, a ceremonial wine. So here <laughs> it is. This is uh, Coppola um, director's cut cinema. So <laughs> uh, uh, that's if really you cool. You can see that it's a very cool bottle of wine, and that's the very best. You know, you can still do good, and if you do. You get Coppola's King Kong. <laughs> and if you're somewhere in between, for you, Technicolor. This is Coppola's <laughs> Technicolor, Wizard of Oz. So wow. uh, that's, wow, uh, that's, that's cool. the schmaltz I use with my dealer and end users. I've given, it, I've given it to billionaires, and they a little tear comes to, to their eye when I give them the story and how, <laughs> you know, how happy we are to have the opportunity to build fine theaters. They're the ones that make it possible. So, mm -hmm. okay, let's move uh, to uh, some more theaters. Moving on down, um, this is their theater. So you can see the execution, the technology, all of that stuff. That's one of the calibrators I had in from Runco. That happened to be a, a Runco execution some years back. Uh, keep moving on down, and we'll we'll see a few more. We can make it almost like a like a movie, 24 frames a second. Here's here's how I rank. <laughs> In, you know, categorically. So again, I give thought and take measurements and we're going to get to the benchmarking one. I'm not sure how much time we have left, but if we can, you'll see how Almost I actually none. look at test uh, test patterns. Looks like you're going to have to have me back again, Scott, but it ain't next week, mm -hmm. I can assure you. No, um, no. Here's how their theater uh, maps out uh, relative to the Samuel Goldwyn. That's a very important part of figuring out that their viewing geometry is right on. So they've got a two height and a three height viewing position in their two rows so it's a compact theater but it's very cinematic you can mm -hmm. it's a good review room and keep on going uh, uh down further and okay this is another 96 done differently this is a 16 foot wide screen keep scrolling down and uh, and down you go and down you go and uh you see there's the technology there's the ranking i gave this uh the, this a uh, 95 down you go further and you'll see um, it's, it's a three, uh, uh, here's the rankings. It's three rows and the screen is seven feet high. The first row is 12 feet. Go down a little farther. We'll see the, we'll see the, uh, uh, the diagram of the floor plan, I think. Uh, yes, quite right. Um, and, and that's the beauty. This is a, 
a, really a no compromise viewing experience room because there's a there's a, a a row that's very close. That's one and a half screen heights. It's you know it's 12 feet from a seven foot high image. Um, constant width, so 16 feet wide in scope. That's very cinematic. And then you've got a row 18 feet back and a row 24 feet back. I'm so proud of this design, uh, driven by the end user and uh, the integrator, Maverick Integration. Um, they fit that in a 26-foot room. Mm. right? So the room was built purposely for this theater, and they did it well. That's a very good example of, of, of getting things right. Um, side masking and all of all of those parameters that I think are important, um, they rung the bell on. So mm -hmm, you can good. keep going uh, to the extent we have uh, more time. This is a reference theater where we're I'm measuring the viewing geometry with my gun sitting in row two. We hadn't actually locked down the seating positions yet in this theater. Um, and the, uh, the, the homeowner who is a real enthusiast that's been doing theaters since the CRT days, twin twin nine inch gun projectors in his first theater, you know, just a no compromise mm. guy and mm -hmm. viewing geometry was critical. And row one was for him. And we literally were moving them back and forth. We went up to the screen and looked at it and then stepped back so that the, where the pixel density disappeared. And then we said, now the viewing geometry can be considered because you're not going to see artifacts. And we locked the, the seating down. And if you go further, you'll see what the viewing geometry was, driven by the preference of this end user in the design of the theater. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very cinematic. So, um, well, yeah, I scroll think, on down. Uh, yeah, let's let's keep going down here. So we've, you've basically you've created a bunch of very high end, very high performing home cinemas that conform to the uh, rating system that you've developed. Uh, to to be as close as possible, and these are all yeah. in the well into stop the 90s. There, Josh, I think that's a good stopping point. Uh, so you can see he's got you know good, better, best, or small, medium, large, however you want to look at it, related to a professional space designed by the people who make the movies. Uh, it's hard to do better than that, and his preference was was factored in. So that that row, if you ask me, I'd stick a row in front of row one, but uh, but that would be slightly crazy, you know, one and a quarter screen <laughs> heights back. But but nonetheless, mm -hmm. that room is a spectacular room at every level, and that's a room with an opaque screen and the sound system uh, flanking the screen. No no uh, acoustical transparency whatsoever. The highest resolution you can possibly get in the image. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, to to sort of summarize here, because we are kind of out of time. Uh, Really, if you're thinking about doing a home cinema, you want to take, you want to consider all of these factors that you have outlined here for us today and try to maximize them, get them as close to that 10 as you possibly can in order to replicate the home cinema, the commercial cinema experience at home as closely as possible, right? Exactly right. And, you know, we're not talking about audio, but of course, it's just as important. And I will say, Paul Hales was on your show. Another guy you had back twice in a row because the content kind of, you know, um, begged that. Uh, yeah. He His philosophy is right on. And uh, if, you, if you have a one-inch dome at every location, you can't do cinema levels. Cinema levels require uh, 105 dB co uh, constant two-thirds back in the room. Um, uh, and, and in cinema, they, they have to be able to do that for two hours straight. That's part of the measuring test. Well, you'll mm. heat voice coils and compress, and that's why hi-fi based uh, audio systems always seem like they're, they're on the edge because they are. So systems like the James loudspeaker system with their quad tweeter array, uh, Procella, which uses a, um, a wave guide with compression drivers to get that horsepower into the room. Um, I think, uh, you know, Wisdom does it by using um, line arrays, you know, a, full, a planar dynamic, you know, very tall speaker that puts a cylindrical wave front into the room so it doesn't decay as fast, 3 dB per doubling of distance instead of 6. There are a lot of ways to do it, but you have to think about that uniformity in the space and hitting the levels. Not that you need to hit the levels, but you're not going to duplicate the art if you're not able to and, and in trying to if you compress. Dynamic compression is the worst thing. It's the worst in the image. You know, modulated irises and 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 uh, local dimming on TVs. 
that's dynamic compression. It ruins the art, if you ask me. And mm. audio compression in loudspeakers is probably the number one problem in sound system design, especially if your room's a little larger. If your room is, you know, is is is, is you know, you know, twelve by fifteen, eight foot ceiling, you can maybe compromise a bit. But you still need the dynamics. My room's not large, and if you look at my front wall, I've got the equiv- I've got twenty one inch domes addressing the front stage, uh. right? I will not compress. I'm distributing the power and the dynamics over that much space. And mm. um, that's at least 12 dB more than a hi-fi speaker could could approach. Wow. Um, well, you know what? And, and, I, I, we, we're going to have to have you come back to talk about the audio because that's a, yet another critical component, <laughs> as you said. And you started to allude to it here, but we're out of time, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> uh, so will you, will we've you come done, back? We've ended will you come back and uh, talk about audio? Like three times. I will send you an outline, maybe November or December, whatever's good, when you've got some downtime, and I'll sure. be prepared where we're just talking about audio in an Great. efficient way. I'll have some graphics that'll uh, help it run efficiently for you. Excellent. Well, we've been just chock full of interesting information today, uh, and I want to thank you so much for being here for part two, uh, or part three, really, based, based on uh, what we talked about back in November, and uh, come back again for part four, and we'll talk about audio. That would be just awesome. Will thank be. you. Be happy to. Great. That's uh, John Bishop. Uh, you can email him if you have any questions at jbishop at b, the letter b, dash accurate. Uh, you can always find me online at avsforum.com, and you can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at avsforum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg, or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, John and I and tens of thousands of our closest friends will be at the Cedia Trade Show. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pre-record Home Theater Geeks for next week. That will be tomorrow, Friday, September 1st from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. My guest will be a headphone guru, Tile Hertzens. And he's very interested in answering questions from listeners. So I do hope you will be able to join us. That is tomorrow, Friday, September 1st, 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. And come into the chat room and post questions for Tile about headphones. And uh, he will be very happy to answer them. That's what he asked if we could do. And I said, of course, happy to. So I do hope you will join us for that. Until then, geek out.